I, I'm basically showing our most recent data out, out to five years, but I'll try to get through this quickly, and then if there's any sort of um, procedural questions, maybe uh, we can address those at the end. So as everywhere in, in, uh, in developed countries around the world, we're seeing an increased proportion of patients that are 80 years of age or more undergoing cardiac surgery in Germany. Uh, and this trend will simply continue. And we think for TAVI that it is a very good procedure for the appropriate patient. And we have a particular bias at our center that we think that transapical is a very good uh, subsection of the TAVI population. Um, just as a little bit of history, the, uh, Tommy Walter and, and Fred Moore and Michael Mack uh, did, I believe, the first uh, transapical in the world at our center in 2005. Um, they implanted two of them, had to take them out uh, afterwards because of um, paravalvular leak. And then about a year later, we proceeded with um, uh, oversizing. That was the first time that we went with the oversizing concept based on what we knew from uh, John Webb's experience and from Cribier's experience. And that uh, seems to take care of the uh, paravalvular leak pro problem. But uh, because we were um, the first, uh, we had sort of a referral ba basis for patients coming for transapical, and ours was not a transfemoral first center, at least not at the beginning. And we do think that it has some definite uh, advantages, which Olaf already covered, that it's a direct approach, it's anti-grade uh, crossing of the aortic valve, and that the distance between the apex and the actual aortic valve is very short, resulting in uh, excellent control. There's no limitation in sheath diameter, although sheath diameter is becoming less and less of a problem with, uh, uh, as the um, companies are making more and more progress in this area. Uh, we feel that it's applicable in, in all patients, uh, nearly all patients, including those with severe peripheral vascular disease. The only ones that we, we stay away from are the patients with bad COPD. And, um, you know, I know that there's some centers that do just transfemoral and occasionally subclavian um, and no transapical, but I really think that is the wrong approach because there are definitely patients where a transapical approach is very straightforward. And then the other uh, advantage is that there's no retrograde crossing of the aortic arch with the valve and the, uh, and the device, uh, which we believe minimizes the stroke risk, which, of course, stroke is a uh, hot uh, topic in TAVI. Uh, despite that, at our center, you see we reached the peak uh, number of transapical implants in 2009, and then we lost uh, Tommy Walter. He became chief in Bad Nauheim, and Tommy was really a... a, a his level of, of energy is it's pathologic. He, the guy is really um, motivated, and, and he really pushed the, the program. And since then, we've, since his uh, departure, we've seen an um, uh, increase in the transfemoral, and that is despite the fact that Professor Moore, is the, he's the medical director for the whole clinic. So in our center, the cardiologist, the chief of cardiology, actually reports to the chief of cardiac surgery. So obviously there is some implicit uh, uh, acknowledgement on our, on our part that transfemoral is also a very good technique and uh, um, that a lot of patients can benefit from it. So this is one of the papers that Tommy published. He published many, many, many papers. Um, so the one that we have the most experience with and the one that we feel uh, most comfortable with for a transapical approach is the Edward Sapien. Uh, as you know, this is bovine pericardial uh, tissue leaflets uh, mounted on a balloon expandable uh, steel stent with the, poly, um, uh, the PET skirt. And uh, there have been some modifications of the Sapien um, more recently, including the addition, addition of anti-calcification treatment, which may have some implications for long-term durability, and, of course, the uh, bigger size range, so up to 29 uh, millimeters. Um, this is our experience up to last year. At the end of 2011, we had 439 uh, transapical patients, a typical TAVI type of population, average age 81, Logistic Euro score almost 30%, STS score about 11%, the median NYHA classification 3, uh, the majority of patients, about two thirds of patients being uh, female, and of course all of them had aortic stenosis. Uh, peripheral vascular disease, very common, 18% of these patients. And chronic uh, COPD, I should say, that's mild to moderate COPD. If they have an FEV1 of less than 1.0 liters, we tend uh, to say uh, no uh, to transapical. This is one of our two hybrid suites. I acknowledge the fact that we are very uh, 
um, lucky to have two uh, hybrid suites, and that is not the case in uh, all centers in the UK. But I do find that these are very, very helpful for these procedures because of the big rooms, the, the high quality fluoroscopy, and also um, the, the space that's required for the large number of, of members of the team uh, for these procedures. So we've done these transapicals off pump in 93.8% of patients, 2.5% required a conversion to a sternotomy plus a conventional aortic valve replacement, 6.2% required conversion to uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. So not every patient that goes on cardiopulmonary bypass requires a sternotomy. Sometimes they just crash hemodynamically, you put them on pump, rest them for half an hour, and then they get better. Two tricks we've learned. One is to watch out because you're, you're doing a balloon valvuloplasty and then you position the valve inside and this is, this is all happening in a hypertrophied heart. You're basically obstructing all blood flow to, uh, onto the left ventricular outflow tract and if you're taking too long, these are very thick uh, hypertrophied ventricles, the blood pressure keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. If you don't watch out, then you fall off the cliff and you can't, you can't get the uh, patient back. So what we've learned is keep an eye on the blood pressure, make sure you keep it up and second thing that we've learned is if we see the blood pressure is dropping, we go ahead and give uh, adrenaline directly over the pigtail catheter. So it goes right straight into the coronary arteries right away rather than giving it systemically and taking 30 seconds to get into the patient. So uh, those are the uh, valve sizes that we've implanted. Reballooning has been required in 8.7% of patients. Additional apical suturing in almost 10% of patients. However, the vast majority of those were easily controlled. Only two patients, two out of 450 have died from uh, or have required uh, full sternotomy and uh, patch repair of the apex, one of whom died. So we did uh, analyze our data according to the VARC criteria, and I think this is a big uh, plus for TAVI because it makes it a level playing field for everybody. Myocardial infarction rate, very low, 1.1%. Bleeding, 6.2%, but a lot of that includes uh, um, just uh, transfusions more than three. That's a definition in VARC as major bleeding. Acute kidney injury, 16.3% had stage three injury, which is significant injury. And new pacemaker implantation, 6.5%, probably higher than conventional aortic valve replacement, but certainly uh, much lower than, uh, for example, the uh, established literature rates for the core valve. Uh, Reintubation, 18%. So um, our default for these patients is they do not go to the ICU. They go directly to our PACU, and then from there they will go to either to the floor or to the step-down unit um, uh, a day or two later. Only thing is make sure you keep them on telemetry, okay? At the beginning of our experience, we had a couple of patients that we found dead in the bed a couple of days later and uh, um, who otherwise had no uh, possible cause for that other than an arrhythmia. So we like to have telemetry, even if they're on the normal station, for up to five days. Stroke, 4.2%, but uh, half of those were periprocedural and half of them were delayed. And then major vascular complications still can occur with a transapical approach, although much less than for a transfemoral approach. And uh, of those, one of them had a type A dissection. Minor vascular complications can also occur at the puncture site in the femoral artery, but uh, like I said, less than a transfemoral. Um, there is, was some support structure deformation of the valve in 9.4%, but a lot of that is just non-circular configuration of the prosthesis, and that's probably related to the non-circular shape of the uh, aortic annulus. Patient prosthesis mismatch here, PPM, only 1.4% of patients. Very, very uncommon. These, va these valves have excellent, excellent hemodynamic performance. Endocarditis, almost unheard of and malpositioning or acute malcooptation. Mal acute malcooptation, I'll show that a bit later in my complications talk, but sometimes you just see one of the leaflets is not completely opening, probably related to native cal calcified leaflet that is over top of the valve, and you have to watch out for that. It causes severe transvalvular leak. The way to fix it is a valve in a valve, so as a rescue procedure. Uh, the echocardiographic results are very good mild AI, and that's a combination of uh, perivalvular or transvalvular uh, in about 40% uh, of patients, uh, but moderate uh, AI, uh, 5%, and I'll address that a bit more in my next talk. Device success, 90%, uh, 95% had a successful vascular access, 97.5% in the correct position, and uh, these are all uh, definitions according to VARC, and a 30-day combined safety endpoint 
um, in it, uh, one of those adverse events that you see listed at the bottom there occurring in 20% of patients. So, and this is our overall survival up to five years, about 44% uh, patients still alive five years post-procedure, which is uh, better than definitely better than medical management for these patients. And just the last slide here, um, there are some, some uh, d device limitations, control of the accuracy of the positioning of the valve. Sorry, doesn't want to go. Uh -huh, okay. Valves that cannot be completely sheathed or resheathed, paravalvular leaks, pacemaker requirements, stroke, unknown durability, and unpredictable sudden catastrophic events. These are the last two are the ones that I think are really going to limit this technology in low-risk patients in the future. And these are just some of the other valves which are currently available transapically, um, all three of which we actually had first in man at our center. So I'll just skip through that. In conclusion, Uh, TAVI can be performed with good outcomes in high-risk patients with severe AS, to transapical, I mean. Additional interventions, however, are required in about one in eight patients. There is a low incidence of vascular complications and strokes, uh, lower than transfemoral access. And these standardized VARC definitions, I think, are good to make, uh, facilitate comparison between studies and across patient populations. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you for... Um, an excellent talk, obviously a fantastic experience that you have, but it still shows that there are some issues that need resolving uh, with TAVI, and you're clearly going to talk yeah, about some of those and, this afternoon. And the transapical approach, I just want to stress that once again, it's not dead, it's not going to go away, it will play a significant role in the future, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that's why you see many companies are developing these new transapical products. Ide. Yeah, that includes our, our first 15 patients where we standardized. We, we said, okay, we're going to put them all on pump through the groin. So that's why the rate is a bit higher. Nowadays, it's about 2 to 3%. It's very uncommon using the tricks that I talked about. But it is occasionally absolutely um, life-saving, and I have seen them where we just put them on pump for 30 to 60 minutes and then wean them off of pump. They, they have this hemodynamic collapse once you've got the valve in place. You do an angio, the coronaries are open, you don't have an explanation for it. I think sometimes it's coronary spasm, to be honest. But they do recover an hour later and you're able to wean them off pump without opening their chest. Olaf. Well, I would say, I, I would be cautious about saying that transapical because of inferior results that we've seen more transfemorals. I wouldn't say that. There is no evidence out there in the literature right now that adequate, adequately addresses this issue and can say if one is better than the other. However, we can probably say that the transapical is more invasive. Whether that means it's worse, that's arguable. So we acknowledge that it is more invasive, and in some uh, elderly patients, um, av avoiding a mini thoracotomy is probably a good thing. But the, the you know, the, the ba paper that was presented at the TCT last year, and then you saw it got this press release from TCT basically saying transapical is dead, that it's got worse results. That was basically um, uh, based on 30 day quality of life comparison between transapical and transfemoral. And when you have something that's more invasive and you measure something 30 days later, yes, of course you're going to have difference in quality of life. At one year, there was no difference in quality of life. And you know which had the best quality of life was conventional aortic valve replacement. One year, 
later. So um, I would be very cautious to say that transapical has inferior results. Could I just take that a bit further? Because you, you made a comment about um, that you weren't a sort of transfemoral first unit. And the impression I get that unit, units like yourself that's not transfemoral first, uh, Berlin, I think Malcolm and Derriford, you know, units which really embrace transapical and do a lot of them tend to get better results than you see across the board. Um, I'd be interested in view of that. And also the comment on the, on the statement that you made that, you know, you, people should use it as a, as a, even as a niche thing. I agree there's a role for transapical, but if you're not doing a lot, say, say you're like ourselves, there's a lot of transfemoral, subclavian direct aortic. If we have a transapical case, shouldn't we be sending it to a high volume transapical unit? Yeah, it's like everything. If you do it more often, you get better at it. And it's going to be also the future for uh, mitral valve uh, access. We have that, we've done that now in 15 patients, and that's just going to keep going up and up and up. For ischemic MR, mitral repairs, transapical is the way.